The following is a live broadcast of a Lone Star Community Radio program. Recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Connors FM 104.5, 106.1, and Facebook.com slash IRLoneStar. For more information on this show, please visit our show page at IRLoneStar.com slash shows. To sponsor or donate to this program, visit our donate page at IRLoneStar.com slash donate. Or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com or give us a call at 936-666-1084. Lone Star Community Radio production and broadcast is possible by folks like you. So sponsor and donate today. Hey, this is Lowe with Soul Harbor, and you are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Welcome to the Legal Connection Show. This is Tony Collins, and I host the uh, Legal Connection Show every Tuesday at noon with uh, Cheryl Jahani. We are both licensed um, attorneys in Texas. Uh, you can hear us on IRLoneStar.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page where you can listen to us live. And you can also um, watch our show later if you can't th hear it live um, on YouTube just by Googling the Legal Connection show. Um, we're, we're on the local FM channels, FM 104.5 and FM 106.1 um, on your FM station. So uh, today's show is going to be a part two. Uh, last week we went over defendants' civil liberty rights and uh, versus the victim's confidentiality rights. And um, basically, that is uh, what what the defendant is entitled to when he's accused versus what information can be obtained about the victim in various cases. And in this and what we've been using as an example is uh, sexual assault cases because there's uh, the victim is so protected by um, rape shield laws and, and various other uh, confidentiality right, uh, laws that come into play, whether it be a protective order or the rape shield laws or, or statutes for victims. And, uh, but on what I'm, I'm representing several clients right now that are, uh, have been uh, accused uh, improperly. They're presumed innocent. They didn't do what they were accused of. Uh, we don't know what the motive was, but after doing a lot of evidentiary uh, research, we have a pretty good idea. And, and so we're going to talk about, t what we're going to talk about today is the d rights, that the balancing act between the defendant's rights and the victim's rights. And um, I'm going to read a quote from Alan Dershowitz um, in a minute after I kind of give you a segue of what we're going to talk about in, in general uh, that will give you an idea. And then we're going to have a little discussion with our uh, station manager, Dick, to find out what he feels about uh, some of these things. Okay, so... Um, the first section is going to be an overview of, of what we talked about last week and about uh, the rights to, for, to the defendant and to the victim. Uh, the second section today is going to be the rights of the accused uh, under the Texas Constitution, the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, and the various law case laws uh, case law that have come through uh, for each of the uh, for different areas of the law. And uh, the third section is going to be uh, the rights of the victim and what what we can obtain and what we cannot obtain, um, uh, what we can obtain and what can be disclosed and what can be brought up in trial. Okay, so um, Alan Dershowitz, he is a Harvard professor. He contributes to Fox News. I've seen him on CNN. Um uh, he is a, a fairly well-known attorney, and he'd done a paper on the privacy rights of rape victims. And um, according to Alan Dershowitz, uh, withholding the name 
not only further stigmatizes rape, the name of the victim, it also endangers the civil liberties of those who are accused of a crime for two reasons. And this would be any accusation, but we're talking about rape today, uh, accusations of rape. Uh, First, it implies that the unnamed person was indeed a victim. And it secondarily, it hinders the presumption that the defendant is innocent. So it's, you know, in the Constitution provides that a person is innocent to proving guilty. And if somebody can just randomly throw out there that, you know, make an accusation for whatever their motivation may be, one of the seven deadly sins that somebody uh, has, has committed a crime, that hurts that innocent party for that entire period that the trial is going on until they're exonerated. And just like we were talking about last week, if you've got, um, uh, you know, uh, Chief, uh, not Chief Justice, but Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, he was um, falsely accused by uh, the, 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 the psychologist, and I can't remember her name right off. When you get the, uh, when you have, you know, uh, girls that are accusing the whole college teams of, you know, uh, the rugby players or whatever of, of assault because they're upset that they're not dating them anymore, whatever the case may be, or maybe there's some financial motive. When you've accused these people of, of, uh, of a crime that they did not commit, it taints their name almost forever. It's really hard to take that taint away. Um, it's a form of defamation, really. And so what we're talking about today is uh, what the, what we can do um, in the short term to uh, clear the, the uh, defendant's name when he is falsely accused when all is said and done. Um, Alan Dershowitz, uh, and I'm going to quote him, says, people who have gone to the police and publicly invoked the criminal process and accused somebody of a serious crime, such as rape, must be identified. In this country, there is no such thing and should not be such a thing as an anonymous accusation. If your name is in court, it is a logical extension that it should be printed in the media. This is all public anyway. How can you publish the name of the presumptively innocent accused, but not the name of the accuser? And so I'm going to get your take on this, uh, Station Manager Dick. I mean, you know what my position is. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Um, I have, I exonerate many, many defendants, and I believe, uh, I wholeheartedly believe that if somebody um, is going to make an accusation, then they've laid it out there that they're open for the ac- that to be to be the the evidence should be uh, made public because it's going to be in the public trial anyway. So what do you think? What well, if it was your wife? What if it was you or your wife that was falsely accused? Or what if your wife was actually, uh, let's say, date raped or raped or, you know, she was a victim of a crime? Well, are there certain definitions when you file the complaint that you don't do like an umbrella rule where everyone's who's accused, accuser is going to be released? Because I understand the 18 and younger kind of rule yes juveniles well, I, are on I, a I, t- I, totally I, different set of rules i think uh one of the and this is coming from a person who watches a lot of svu um uh, <laughs> one of the general fears that you you gather from people who have been you know either raped molested xyz is they're afraid to come forward because they don't want to face their accuser or they don't want, you know, the fear they don't of want to reliving. be further victimized. Yes. And I think uh, in in the protocols that led up to this, like they're trying to defend that person or protect that person as right. much as possible. Right. Now, I think it, like I think the smart way to do it is you can't have both. So it's either no one's gets named mm-hmm. and it's just private. Right. Both sides are private right. in the court. Right. Or bo- both are publicly. That is the right way to Cause, do it. Because mm-hmm. and they, you can even say that it, people who are publicly accused of something, you know, a large percentage of people hearing it already think he's guilty or right, she's guilty. Right, right, right. They go into court so, looking at the person in the uh, at the table at the defense table, um, already looking at them like you've uh, you've already you've been to the court system and the police thought you did it, and apparently a grand jury thought you did it. And and now you're here, and although the presumption under the Constitution and our rights yeah. are that you're innocent, they've already they're already looking at who's the they're, it's a he said she said they're looking at both parties, yeah. and so um, I'm I'm with you. Uh, it either should both should be unnamed, 
and the judge would know whether the bond should be higher and what the requirements should be if they should be free pending trial, whether it be an ankle bracelet or, and they are having no contact. That's a given. If you've been accused by somebody, there is a, an automatic statutory right to the victim that no contact can be made yeah. to them. So they're already protected in that way. But uh, what we're running up against is just like in the Kavanaugh trial where we have, um, whether it be an ex-girlfriend or a, a, a an angry, estranged wife or a, somebody that's got a financial motive to sue a hotel or sue a bar or sue that person. Well, in the Kav- Kavanaugh, they, that woman was named. She was named, but she wasn't... Um, yeah, in that in that case, she was named, but she made the accusation. So that's a little bit different. You're right. In in this in this genre, we're talking about rights and naming victims. She came out though, and even though she was named, she still tainted it. That was the thing. Was she came out, and she made this accusation, and it was false. But she was named, and that was correct. And I believe that uh, a large part of how and I also don't think she was filing a suit against them. I think it was just. She was brought forward because— As a, as a color witness, or whatever right, you call it. Right, right. Um, she was brought forward as a witness to show that he did not have good character. Yeah, character witness. And, uh, right. Character witness. So, um, so you're right, and she came forward. But rightfully so, that we were able to look at her background, which she had a pretty good background, actually. I mean, she had a she had lived a pretty clean life, and she was well-established and well-educated. And, and believable to the extent if you looked at her character, she looked like she was believable. It was just that she had— no supporting evidence to support no. that it actually happened. And in the, the case that, that we were using as an example uh, this last week and this week, um, we have got an accuser who, like um, in the Kavanaugh case, there's no evidence to support any of her accusations. It was It's all been torn down, and it's, it's, it has no weight whatsoever. That information should be brought forward, just like in the Kavanaugh case, to at least let anybody that sees it, to have an equal opportunity, if you're gonna if you're gonna display it like that, if you're not going to, even if it didn't go to trial, even if this case that we are talking about right now didn't go to trial, my clients, and, and I'm talking about this one in particular because it's the one that I kind of use my content for, my client's name has been smeared, to some extent, his name has been brought out and this other name has not been brought out, and it's unfair because the other name there's actually, we've actually uncovered. So many lies uh, in the cell phone records, in mm-hmm. statements that were made to the police, in um, statements that were made at the location where this allegedly occurred, and in her own demeanor because she was claiming no consent. When we have all these records to show that this woman um, uh, was fully within her capacity mentally and physically to – and she was the aggressor. She was the one that was soliciting it. So that if that's the case, it should be – the he said, she said should come out. If you're making these accusations – during during the pretrial, then the same the, at the same turn, the same evidence should come out during pretrial. And if you want to make it a public trial before it even goes to court, fine. But just like you said, it should all be kept undercover, or it should all be equally made available, and not to hurt the victim because the victim. Well, I think it's something that people need to understand the rules when they play the game. Yeah. And yes. And you do, and you do have sympathy for the the alleged victim. Mm-hmm. Because of what they're trying to say, accuse of this person. Right. If it, it really did happen, it really I mean, did it's, happen. It's a horrible right. thing. Mm-hmm. But I also think that with the court, it should be. I mean, you're bringing it up. You're changing this person's life. You're accusing. You're you're not just like a. You're you're not just sending a, a letter that's cryptic and you go, this guy did it. Right. Like you know, right. you're coming in. You're bringing charges you're against this person. You're saying only, and the only thing that's showing in the public record when an accusation is made is. This particular presumed innocent defendant um, raped me. And then until that case, and the cases can go on for years, yeah. um, until that he's exonerated, you still have people that there's a taint when they walk in. And, you know, when I do my voir dire, um, you ask them, are you, uh, when you, as you see my client sitting right here, do you believe that he's innocent? And a lot of people will be honest. You know, I have I believe that I could be fair, but... I, you know, have my doubts because he's here and an accusation has been made and you can't even get rid of him that way because when you, the the, the states just, you know, they can't wait because like somebody that's like, oh, good, they're leaning our way already. Um, When you approach the judge, the judge is going to let them, if they remain on the jury and the way jury selection is done is the 
the first 12 that are not omitted by, you know, whatever the various rules are, are the ones that will sit on the jury. If you can't get rid of them, the state wants them, and they're already a little bit tainted, you've got an uphill battle, and that's not the way it should be. It should be you're innocent until proven guilty. Not, you know, if you look at the scale, um, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. That's never going to happen. It never happens. And in fact, I've had so many no, cases. No, it's never going to happen. <laughs> You've got basically people go in and they're without much more. And this is really bad. But and, and jur- jurors have they have really good intentions for the most part. But I would say a majority of the time, at least 50 percent of them are go in and they're looking at he said, she said. And it's this is what I think. You know, they go in with the 50 percent. It, they, they're not going at it beyond a reasonable doubt. They're looking at it. Yeah, I think he did it. You know, I think he should pay. And it's really sad. But you've got that's why when you're a criminal defense attorney, you go into this like it is an all out war. You're going in there with you're taking no prisoners. You're going to get all the evidence you can. Well, if I remember correctly, when I was in jury duty, they never used names. Really? Yes. Well, how would they not use? But names? they had because to do with children. Oh, when it has to do with so children, So it, it was no. a custody. It was a custody thing, and it was like they made a big deal about you know basically giving uh, names, but like they're made up. Right. You know, right. So made up names are, and you can actually do that now. Um, vic- if a victim, there's a statute that allows the victim to ask the prosecutor, even an adult victim, to use a pseudonym so that it's not even their real name. Which, if they do that, that. I mean, that's their, their prerogative, and it's a statute. But juveniles are completely different. Yeah. Under 18, you cannot use their name. They have got a whole different set of rules. The, even their ju- even if an accused is protected, their juvenile record is going to go away to, you know, w- within the parameters of the law. Um, your juvenile record is not coming up. It may be evident to the police and various other agencies, but it's not coming out. That is that is covered. Now, what happens if you have juvenile that are doing all kind of bad things and, you know, they they to have a, a bad home life or whatever and starting it like I, I mean as young as even 12 I see it kind of starting up where they're skipping school and they're smoking pot and they're burglarizing cars and they're doing bad things um, if their record um, it, they can be a I guess a determined there it's I forgot they're certified to be an adult many times because they're such bad juveniles that if they've done if the crime is so bad um, even if what they're 15 and 16, if it's a murder or if it's a rape or whatever, they will be certified as an adult. And then that will, at that certification, their information becomes public like you're not a juvenile anymore. But uh, with regard to uh, the general rights of a victim, juvenile do not. It's, it's initials. It's pseudonym automatically. Yeah. There's no question about that. Okay, so uh, I want to go to the second section segment that we have today, and it's going to talk about the rights of the accused because we talked a lot last week about the rights of the, the victim and and really, um, people need to know what their rights are. And I think my even my um, my my clients and my defendants sort of lose track of what their rights are because they want so bad to be open. But the most important thing that I can tell people out there that are accused of a crime, uh, even if it's being pulled over by the police, a Class C misdemeanor, something you're not going to be arrested for, was uh, police and first responders are really good people. Um, for the most part, I will say that. Ninety-five percent of them are my friends. I like them. They're doing a really good job, and and uh, they uh, I cherish that what they're doing for our community. But sometimes you'll get people that are over- overzealous. They're trying to you move up the ranks. Um, they uh, they are people too. And the most important thing you can do when you're pulled over is uh, are, are accused is to be polite. Your first responders are people too. You've got to look at them like they're human beings. Look out for their own safety. We've talked about this in all these other shows. Um, be very polite. And I think you want to go to, um, just like what God says, you want to treat people, uh, what is the commandment you want to uh, serve God by serving others, but you need to treat people and love people like you love yourselves. And hopefully you love yourself. But you want to treat people right. You want to uh, consider their safety, consider that they're human beings, and be polite to them. But the second most important golden rule, and it's almost right up there with it, is you've got a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Anything that you say can and will be used against you. That's in the Miranda rule. Even if they don't tell you, you should know that. Just don't say anything if you don't have to. And if you need to blame it on the attorney that you haven't even hired it yet, say, my attorney has advised me that I need to remain silent. Nothing against you, but I'm not going to say anything. Um, you know, there's a, a fine line when if you're pulled over uh, and you're asked to do a breathalyzer test because you maybe you were swerving, maybe you dropped your phone or whatever, and you haven't been drinking, 
you will be arrested if you don't take that breathalyzer test. So just consider, you know, use your common sense. Don't say nothing and don't, I'm not going to do anything. You haven't been drinking. If you've not been drinking at all and you haven't been chewing gum and you haven't been, uh, there's no reason for you to, to believe that they're in any way going to uh, a, a fine that you've been driving while intoxicated. You will get arrested if you don't take the breathalyzer. So the, use your judgment. But one of your constitutional rights is to remain silent because, and I will repeat this because it's so critically important. Whatever you say can and will be used against you. Okay, now, um, I want to go over um, what your rights are. And I had them right in front of me. Um, the rights of the accused, okay? And I kind of was jumping over to grand jury proceedings, but I'm just going to go over really, really quickly the rights of the accused. Um, Texas Code of, well, let me go first to the, the Constitution. Article 1, Section 10 of the Texas Constitution is your, the rights of accused in criminal pr pr prosecutions. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall have a right to a speedy trial by an impartial jury. That is, that, you know, takes a wallop because first, to try to get an impartial jury, what we just talked about, how people come in with a bias automatically if they're called to jury duty. They're law-abiding citizens. They don't want to be the next victim. So they're already a little bit impartial just to start out with. And your right to a speedy trial is your Sixth Amendment right. And that will be foregone to some extent when you've got COVID and you've got lots of other prosecutions before you. And the reason you have a right to a speedy trial is because you don't want your name being tainted for years and years. Um, and it may be because you're just not next in line. And automatically, if somebody's in jail and they can't bond out because their bond's too high, their trial is going to be ahead of somebody who is out on bond. So your trial may be set out for I don't know how long, and there's really nothing you can do about it. It's just the logistics of the trial. Um, if you feel like, I'm going to throw this in here because it's really, really important. If you feel like you did not get a speedy trial um, or you've, your trial has been delayed unconstitutionally, if by the time you go to trial, your witnesses aren't available, it's been a long time, you want to exercise your right, you want to uh, tell the court, look, my rights, my constitutional right has been violated, um, I did not get a speedy trial, let's say that that's your only error on appeal. You will not be able to use that in trial if you did not properly move for a speedy trial. Let's say your case has gone on for four years, um, it, but you don't want to go to trial because you were really guilty and you were hoping that they would, it would be dismissed and it hasn't been. You can't the day of trial go before the court and say, I want to move for you know uh, my, my, tr my case to be dismissed because um, – uh, dismissed because I did not get a speedy trial. That's not how it works. The the law, the way the law works, and there's lots of case law that supports this all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. If you did not, if you did not want to get a trial, and so you just kind of let it ride out, and it's the last minute you say, "All right, well, my my constitutional rights have been violated," they'll say, "No, you didn't ask for it." So you're not, we're going to deny your motion for dismissal under your constitutional rights being violated under a speed, speedy trial, um, uh, 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 I don't want to say act, but your speedy trial right. Um, and if you, if you didn't ask for it, if you asked for it too late, you've waived it, basically. So don't go there. Um, your other rights, and I'm just going to kind of list these real quick. You have the right to demand the nature and the cause of the accusation, uh, accusation against you to have a right of a copy of the, the charge against you. Um, you shall not be compelled to give evidence against yourself and have shall the right to be, shall have the right of being heard by himself or by counsel or both. And you have the right to confront your witnesses. So if you, just like we were talking uh, early earlier, if a witness makes an accusation against you, you have the right to the act to confront that witness specifically, that victim, that alleged victim. If nobody else shows up, that victim has to show up. And in the case of children, where you've got a super aggravated sexual assault, and I had I'd done one of these a number of years ago, uh, where you've got a child under six who has made an outcry, and usually that outcry is not done by the child, but it's done by one of their uh, relatives or guardians or a school teacher, whatever, um, you still have the right to confront that child. And uh, there have been some recent cases where there have been one-way videos done so the child doesn't have to be in a court. And that has now been sort of whittled down where even 
the child, uh, the, the, the person that's being accused, has the right to confront that victim, not just uh, in some circumstances, not just by a one-way video. And the reason is because the child will lie too because they've been – They've been tainted by, you know, grandmother, mother, whoever it may be, saying, if you say this, then I will give you this. And they're they're patted on the back and they're given positive reinforcement for saying the same thing over and over. And they're not they haven't been it, it will be evident to a jury that they've been coached and somebody's life is at stake. Secret aggravated sexual assault is something where you basically it's worse than murder. And if it really did happen, they should get the punishment worse than murder. But if it didn't happen, and many, many times you've got a child custody battle or a, a grandmother that just wants custody or somebody wants the actual father out of the picture, they will coach a child to make um, these very flimsy accusations and somebody will be in prison for the rest of their life without ever having, with no evidence whatsoever, no DNA evidence, nothing without so much as being able to confront this witness or even see the records of the outcry. They're, you're completely kept in the dark when it comes to a child that young. So it's really, really serious, and the laws have changed that favor um, the defendant in limited circumstances. And so if, you've, if you're an attorney or you are a defendant that has this on your record, uh, since the laws have changed um, to some degree, you may be able to get a writ to – uh, reopen your case to get it um, to look at to to be able to confront your witness. They may have aged out. They may be older. Um, or, or, or there's various things you can look at. But don't all is not lost. You, the, the law is, is now becoming a little bit more favorable to defendant to get that evidence. Um, uh, and to, to continue on that with the uh, with the Constitution, except that when the witness resides out of state and the offense is charged is a violation of any of the antitrust laws of the state, the defendant in the state shall have the right to produce and have the evidence admitted by deposition under such rules and laws of the legislation, and no such person shall be held to answer to a criminal offense unless on an indictment of a grand jury, except in cases in which the punishment is by fine or imprisonment. And, you know, this goes on and on. But just read um, uh, Article 1, Section 10 of the Texas Constitution. Uh, basically, with very few exceptions, you get to confront your uh, accuser in person. And um, the, you also, uh, in the case of a felony, you get two bites at the apple. It's not just a complaint like it is in misdemeanor court, but you get to run the, the case for probable cause, not just by a judge, but by a grand jury. And I wanted to briefly hit on the rights that you have through a grand jury because um, it's sort of a, um, I don't want to say it's it's not well known what goes on in the grand jury and what your rights are. And so I'm going to run this by you again, Station Manager Dick, uh, since you're pretty knowledgeable with all the people that you have on your station and all the, the shows that you have. What do you know about the grand jury? Uh, from what I understand, it, it's different. Is it different in every state? The way a grand jury is put um, together. It's not really different in every state. It's slightly different because then, all laws are different, a it, little different in every state. In Montgomery, Montgomery County, they, it's, I think it's a 30-day or is it three months? Um, you have a right to, um, to for your case to be presented to a grand jury. Um, and I believe it's it's it, I don't know if it's by statute or it's just by a rule, but you have to have a it's reasonable. It's it's the way they've worded it. And well, from what I understand, the process goes if like if I accuse you of something, and the police do an investigation to mm -hmm. gather as much evidence, and they give it they give that over to the DA, mm -hmm. and the DA presents it to a grand jury, which is. I don't think it's 12 people. It's something like... And, and we're going to talk about that. It's, it's a certain amount of people, right. and basically they oversee all the cases for either a month or three months mm -hmm. that the DA wants to bring to prosecution. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different in each county, but that's generally yeah. correct, right? And uh -huh. basically then that grand jury sees all the evidence the DA has, and they go, yes, this person or this there is company, probable or, cause, right. there's probable cause, so you can take it to the actual courtroom, right? which begins the next step. Right. They get indicted. Okay. So, and that's a pretty good overview of what the grand jury does. And anyone can be on it. You're selected. Right. And that those rules became, um, we, we could do a whole show on grand juries. Because grand juries, um, the way that the, the composition of the people on them was um, was not fair to many defendants because they would pick police officers or the judge's friend or a prosecutor's friend.
they change the composition. You can't, you're not randomly selected? No. In fact, um, if you you are actually now, uh, at least in Harris County, there's a, when they send out the the forms for you to be on the jury, the, uh, that the, the, it's also the grand jury. So it's a mail out. And I believe the federal, um, the federal list of people that is their pool, the people that will be on the jury, is based on your voter registration, whereas I think it's your driver's license in Texas. And I can't remember because, you know, I'm not, you know, a county clerk. I don't know what their pool I, people I just are. remember when I was being told about it, it was really suspicious because you're basically asked to work like eight-hour days. Right. Twice. It's like, um, uh, at but, least in Harris County, it's a little bit different in Montgomery County, Um you uh, go in twice a week, twice a month. So it's like four days a month. Yeah. And and in Cares County, it's at large. They have different pools of grand juries that go uh, that work with like eight different courts at yeah. a time. And the prosecutor will present that case. I and think I, here it was like it was just a it was a set amount of people, and they, it was either thirty days basically they're right. working. If you don't get, um, if your case is not brought, and this is Texas wide, if your case is not brought. Before a grand jury, if it's a felony, you don't get that benefit with a complaint that's a misdemeanor. It just is either you have a probable cause or you don't. And probable cause, if you look at the scale, is is much lower than beyond a reasonable doubt, but much higher than reasonable suspicion. And I'm just going to hit three of those. Reasonable suspicion is all the police need to arrest you, okay? Um, probable cause mean is much higher, and there must be probable cause based on the evidence that's been collected to... Um, keep it in court to charge you. Yeah. But if you have a felony, you get the extra step of a grand jury because not just the judge makes that decision. Now a whole new set of people gets to look at it before it's indicted. If the grand jury decides, you know, there's just not probable cause for this, yeah. we're going to no bill it. It's dismissed. Um, if the grand jury decides that there is, and it's called true billing, and it's indicted, that's at that point where they like It's not vote. every complaint gets to the grand jury um only with felonies yeah so it's only with certain felonies. levels right so if it's and with the, with the way the hierarchy of the of charges are you've got classy misdemeanors which are just like traffic tickets or not arrest they cases. don't go to the grand jury um and then you've got your misdemeanors which are class a and b which are dwis the first two you know lower level offenses you'll go be you can it's up to two years in jail and certain fines but um, they're lower level offenses. But when you get to state jail felonies and then your third degree felonies, which are up to 10 years, second degree felonies, which are up to 20 years, and then your first degree felonies and then capital offenses where you could be life in prison or death, then you get a grand jury. So as low as state jail felonies, which are two years in the state jail um, institution, which is in a Tascacita around here, you don't get the benefit of going to Harris County unless you can get a – it's called a rural um, – you know, I'm losing my mind here, but there's a, a rule where you can get Harris County time on a state jail felony if you, uh, you know, uh, meet certain criteria. But that all being said, you, the grand jury is really, really important for people that are charged with a felony. And if you wait too long after they've arrested you, then you'll you lose the benefit of being able to present it to the grand jury because it'll get indicted. It can be indicted. It can be indicted before you even knew about it because a lot of times you get a charge and you don't even know you're charged with it because. There's just an open warrant, and you didn't know. A uh, bond company didn't let you know. There's just it's kind of out there. They could roll it into the grand jury the next week, and the reason that they the prosecutors have this time limit or they want to do it quickly is, if they don't present to the grand jury within 90 days, uh, then you've gotten um, then you may be improperly accused. Um, it, it has to do with the speedy trial issues. It's like your constitutional rights are violated if you, it, particularly if you're if you don't have a bond. If you aren't, uh, if your case isn't brought before the grand jury within 90 days, particularly in Harris County, and I think it's the same in Montgomery County, then the prosecutors must dismiss the case. There's some case law that says if by that 90-day mark, the you haven't given uh, the opportunity for the defense to to bring forward your argument or whatever the case may be. You, if you're in jail, you are set free and it is dismissed. So they have a they've got on their Rolodex or on their time wheel. I've got to get this to the grand jury by the time certain. If the defense asks for it to be a grand jury hold, it can be it can be a full year, two years before it's brought before the grand jury because the defense is now collecting information and that's what I do. I say, can I have a grand jury hold because I need to collect evidence to prove that the victim's a liar. 
because a lot of times the victim is a liar. Or maybe there's no victim. Maybe it's the police. The police are out to get somebody. There's a lot of different motivations, and I never know what they are. But I'll ask when I'm first brought onto a case if I can get a short grand jury hold so I can collect evidence and subpoena records so I can go forward to give my client the benefit of uh, a, a, a certain number of people that are on this grand jury to look at it before it gets indicted. All right. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to talk just briefly about grand jury proceedings, because you are correct on much of what you said is for the most part accurate, but I'm just going to refine it a little bit. Um, if you have been charged with a criminal offense or otherwise the target of a grand jury investigation, then you want to know your rights with regard to that, to an indictment. Okay. Um, the information that follows and that I'm, we're going to talk about addresses some of the more important rights that apply to an indictable charge presented to a grand jury. Um, so here's the first thing, the right to testify. An accused has no right to testify before a grand jury unless the grand jury asks the accused to come forward. And if the accused does want to testify, they don't get the benefit of their attorney being in the room with them. I would never allow my client to testify in front of a grand jury. Why? Because anything that he says will be held against him, even in the grand jury room. So unless he's cold, stone cold, without question innocent, uh, and, and I know it, and I've got proof of it, and everything that this person says, you know, because there was no opportunity, there was no motive, there was another, you know, there was nothing. Uh, there, it's highly unlikely I will ever let them testify because that information will speak for itself, and I don't need my person talking. I'm not going to put them through that. Um, so the grand jury may subpoena them to be there, and I will counsel them to say nothing because I can't be there to... They, they, they may be railroaded into saying something that they shouldn't be saying. Um, the prosecutor may extend an invitation for a defendant or target of an investigation to testify, which I've asked many times for other people to be brought before the grand jury. And never once have my witnesses been brought before the grand jury, although I've had them available when it would exonerate my client because they just won't do it. I can bring them to trial, but I can't bring them before the grand jury. Um, under um, a circumstance where a witness is brought forward, a defendant will have the privilege of testifying provided he waives his Miranda rights and the right to counsel as a defense as defense attorneys are not permitted to be present in front of the grand jury, just like we were talking about. So um, they'll testify if they waive their Miranda rights and they waive their right to counsel. And I would never, ever do that. So these are people that are kind of I think they're manipulated into talking to the grand jury. I just have never seen it. Um, okay, your second right um, in a grand jury is the right to presentation of exculpatory evidence. This is really, really important. While the prosecutor presents the state, represents the state, and has no obligation to present the defendant's side of the story, he can just go in there and represent the state, right? Just go in there and say, uh, a rape has occurred, and the accused has said it happened. The prosecutor has an obligation to present evidence to the grand jury that is, quote, clearly exculpatory. In order for evidence to satisfy this threshold, it must refute an element, element of the crime charged. If the prosecutor fails to present evidence that is exculpatory and meets this standard, that conduct warrants dismissal of the indictment. Now, did you follow what I was just telling you? Okay, so I'm gonna re I'm gonna say it in real in English. If the prosecutor knows and has evidence that shows that the person charged did not commit this crime, they must they must bring that forth to the grand jury. If they know that the DNA shows that there is no DNA that supports that that this person raped them, but there is DNA that shows that somebody else did. That's exculpatory. They have to present that. And in the case that I'm talking about today, the, my example case, um, the, my client was accused of date rape, all right? We're not using names, so nobody knows who this is, but my client was accused of date rape. And the only, uh, with date rape, the defense is uh, consent, I don't remember. Uh, if, if the if victim says, I didn't give consent, but you can show that there was consent, 
then that is exculpatory evidence, and it must be presented to the grand jury. So in our case, I've got video evidence. I have evidence showing this woman inviting this guy up to her room. I have evidence from a number of witnesses who were present saying, uh, not only with the video, that uh, the video shows that she was coherent, that she gave consent. She was signing her name and tabulating, uh, you know, tips and what have you. We have all this evidence showing she had full capacity mentally. She had full capacity physically. And she gave consent. Now, did she give consent at the moment uh, that it could have happened? Well, her her uh, argument and her statement is, I don't remember anything. We have evidence showing from the time that, that from the, the, the full time frame that this entire uh, alleged event occurred, she was texting, and she was coherent, and she was spelling everything correctly, and she was uh, making statements to people that during this the whole, like, hour and a half period that was critical to my client. She was coherent, texting. She had full capacity mentally and physically of what was going on, and she's saying she didn't remember anything. And so the video evidence should have been dis- should have been presented to the grand jury. The statements by witnesses showing her uh, her, that she was the aggressor and that she had consent and that she had full capacity mentally and, um, and, uh, and physically that should have been presented because that is clear exculpatory evidence. And in my situation, my client was indicted, but the prosecutor in Harris County said, I didn't bother showing him the video and I didn't bother showing him any of the evidence. In fact, I don't have to show him any evidence. I got this in an email. My indictment should be dismissed. And so I'm going to follow what's called a motion for release of the grand jury testimony and the records that were presented. And while that may be confidential to me, um, this is error and my client's constitutional rights were violated. And I have the evidence now because the prosecutor has disclosed it to me. I mean, it's open. So um, that's, did that make sense to you? I'm make sure that I'm not like talking. I'm glad that you're here so I can bounce these things off of you. If your defense attorney has done their job and they have collected evidence to show that there is evidence to support that that my client and it could be you, it could be anybody has could not have committed this are the only are, are an element of the charge. In this case, it was I didn't give consent. That was the only element because we've got everything else showing that that there was no rape. We have, we have evidence showing that this just did not occur. If that evidence was not provided to the grand jury and there's an indictment, and I can't be there as a defense attorney, but I have a prosecutor telling me I didn't provide that evidence because I didn't have to, I after I file this motion, I should have reversible error if it's not dismissed. And so that's what I'm going to do. Now, um, the... Uh, An accused is also entitled to have a valid defense or justification presented to the grand jury where it exonerates the accused, which is what we were just talking about. This obligation does not, however, however, impose a duty on the prosecutor to investigate or cultivate every potential defense or justification for a felony offense for which an indictment is being sought. Defenses which must be disclosed to the grand jury are those that clearly tend to establish innocence, or that it, that you don't uh, innocence, or that, they, that you can't be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the threshold that must be met to find someone guilty by a judge or a jury. Um, exclusion of illegally or unconstitutionally obtained evidence. A grand jury is permitted to consider evidence that was obtained illegally, improperly, or in violation of law. Now, that's different. This is very different from going to trial. In trial, a, a defense attorney um, can object to any evidence that's obtained illegally. But that is not, at this case, what I just basically was discussing is a prosecutor doesn't have to go look into the case. That's a defense attorney's job. That's the, that's the defendant's job. If but Before indictment and before the grand jury, it is the defense attorney's job and the defendant 
to get all the evidence necessary to show that there is not probable cause. And um, short of that, the prosecutor doesn't have to do that. But in this case, we actually did it. And um, if I didn't even know this existed because I've usually been treated pretty fairly by my prosecutors with regard to grand juries. I've gotten quite a few no bills. Um, but there is something that's called the motion for release of grand jury testimony. Um, the, if you file that, you can get a hearing. We'll go forward. We'll show with the evidence that will come forward. My prosecutor that didn't go, that they didn't present, that I'll be able to get that that um, indictment uh, dismissed. Um, now, what questions do you have before I go forward? Anything? Uh, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> See if uh, what I need to find out if I'm kind of you know, boring you to tears or if you wanted to ask me anything. Okay. Um, I want to go over what the rights of the accused are with regard to specifically a sex crime. And um, I can see we have about 50 minutes left, so I'm going to go over these just sort of in bullet fashion because I want to go over the Michael Martin Act as well as uh, cell phone records and see what you know about those. All right. Uh, rights of the accused. Um, here's what you need to know about your rights when you're accused of a sex crime. Remember that you don't have to talk and do not talk. The infamous first line of the Miranda right says you have the right to remain silent. Why is this important? Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Um, as scary as an ordeal may be, especially when you have the authority fi figure asking you questions, whether it be the police, the prosecutor, uh, a detective, somebody that's like baiting you with, well, if you just tell me what I need to know, I'll let you go. It's no big deal. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of it. We just want to make sure that we have the evidence to make sure that we don't press charges. That's, these are all tools that the prosecutors and the detectives use to get you to talk. Don't buy into it. Sometimes silence can be your best defense. Don't believe everything you're told by the prosecutors or your friends, but you're not, your defense attorney is your best friend. Um, again, when you have the police and detectives saying things to you in an effort to get you to talk, you need to understand that what you're saying may not be entirely true. They can lie to you, and they can lie to you with impunity. They're allowed to withhold facts or misrepresent the truth in order to get you to talk. They may even tell you that if you confess to the, to the crime that they can guarantee you uh, the minimum. Don't believe this. It's a lie. And uh, lots of cases have gone on where people have been improperly prosecuted and found guilty because they have uh, even, especially young kids, um, you know, I say kids, 17 and 18 year olds, um, have said they've done something so they can be released home to go home uh, because they're told by the prosecutors, if you just tell me what I want to hear, you can go home. Don't believe it. It's not true. You may go to prison for the rest of your life. Am I required to supply a DNA sample? The, sor the short answer in Texas is generally yes, but it can depend on the case. DNA evidence is the easiest and surest way to, pr to prove a defendant is guilty, but not necessarily because the DNA evidence may uh, be, it may be tainted. It may be done wrong. It may not show that there's any guilt at all, even if there's DNA uh, evidence that's supporting that you're, you were uh, at a, a, the crime scene or involved. It may not prove guilt. Um, if it isn't already in file, the authorities may request a sample of your DNA to try and match it with hair or body fluids found at the scene. You must supply a DNA sample in cases alleging, alleging child sex abuse as well as felony sex crimes. This requirement can only be waived if a, if a sentence has been sealed or deferred. Um, you are allowed, um, and I'm going to read that again, so it's kind of important. You must apply DNA sample in cases alleging child sex abuse or well as well felony, as felony sex crimes. This requirement can only be waived if a sentence has been sealed or deferred. Um, basically, that means that if you were uh, exonerated or if your case is sealed or if it's the the victim's um uh dna there are certain um situations where the dna will be sealed and it can't be uh, obtained in the future for uh, for any use it will be destroyed um you are another uh, i'm going to jump over to the next right you are allowed legal representation you have the right to attorney you cannot if you cannot afford attorney you will be appointed one this is not um, an automatic. You have to prove that you cannot afford one. The second part of the Miranda rights is telling you that it is, it's probably in your best interest to get a defense lawyer to do the talking for you. 
Private defense attorneys are your best bet since they are typically have more time and resources to devote to your case, to devote to devote to your case. But if you cannot afford to hire an attorney, a public defender can be appointed to you. But don't get me wrong. If you um, have got an appointed attorney or a public defender and they have uh, represented you because you cannot, you have proven that you cannot afford one. Do not be calling a private defense attorney and telling them that you will pay them because you don't trust your attorney or don't go to the court and say you want a different attorney because you don't like that they've found that you were guilty. Private attorneys will not represent you unless you pay them. That is why you got a court appointed or you have the right to an attorney. They're not bad people. You don't have to take a plea. You can go to trial. You can ask all the questions you need. You can, you know, do your research. But if you can't afford a private attorney and you're, you want a private attorney because you are as guilty as sin, then then don't be calling private attorneys and, and are, are trying to get a new attorney because you don't like what your court appointed has to say to you. Court appointeds are, are trained. Uh, they may not have the time and resources of a private attorney, but it may be all you get, so do your own research. Um, are you allowed to be your own lawyer? Yes, you are. If you so choose, you can represent yourself and be the, be the one to question the person who has accused you of sexual misconduct. Depending on your situation, you may feel that this will have a greater impact on your defense. In some cases, the judge may require you to have a lawyer or a public defender to help you make to make to help make sure you have the information and guided needed through the process. Whether or not you're required to hire an attorney seeking professional legal representation is highly recommended, particularly to defend against sex crimes, since these type of cases are very serious. You are allowed to change lawyers during the case. If you if something comes up with the one you have hired, if you haven't paid them, if you get in a dispute with them, if you don't think your lawyer is truly fighting for you and you don't and doesn't fully have your back, you don't have to just sit back. You can get uh, you can wait for defense or and you don't have to wait for your defense to crash and burn. You can request a new lawyer to represent you, even if it's a public defender, but you better have good reason. Um, you are allowed you are allowed to ask to move your case if you're involved in a high profile case and it may be in your best interest to request your case be moved to a different venue. You're allowed, but you better have good reason. You just don't get to change your venue because you don't like the judge, you don't you don't like your attorney, or uh, you, you're trying to you know buy some time. Forget that. You have to have some really good reason to change a venue, and they're usually only on the high, the pro, high profile cases. And you can usually only get it done if you got a private attorney who's really going to fight for it to be changed. Aside from your Miranda rights, and remember that you have the right, you have other constitutional rights. When you're involved in sex crimes, make sure you know all your rights by hiring a competent legal team to, uh, for your defense. But um, I just want to emphasize that when somebody has accused you of sexual assault, it's more than likely, um, on most cases, a he said, she said, take this very seriously, don't blow it off, don't think it's just something I can handle myself. Uh, when somebody says that they've sexually assaulted you, it's such a serious crime that you can go to jail for long periods of time and you may say the wrong thing and um, and it gets you stuck in jail for a long time if you don't take this very, very seriously. Um, I want to go over briefly, and I know we only have a little bit of time here, two things. Um, the the Michael Morton Act. I want to ask uh, Station Manager Dick, do you know what the Michael Morton Act is? No, I don't. Have you ever heard of it? No, I haven't. Okay, it's a really important defendant right. Um, uh, uh, Governor Perry, so this is kind of a new act, um, uh, put into law that prosecutors are required to open their files to defendants and are their attorneys. And if you're represented by attorney, it will only be your attorney um, because they can help you with what you have the right to see and keep records of evidence they disclose. So I'm going to repeat that. Governor Perry requires prosecutors to open their files to defendants and keep records of the evidence that they disclose to the defendants. The act is named the Michael Morton Act for Michael Morton, who was convicted and sentenced to life in prison in 1987. He was exonerated in 2011 after DNA evidence revealed that someone else had murdered his wife. Morton's lawyers discovered that the original prosecutor had withheld evidence that could have proven Morton's innocence. The U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brady v. Maryland in 1963 already required prosecutors to hand over to defendants any evidence that is material either to guilt or to punishment. But in Texas, this new law requires disclosure of all police records and witness statements, regardless of whether the evidence is material to guilt or punishment. 
Um, this is a great day uh, in Texas when this was, it was a great day in Texas when, when Governor Perry put the Michael Morton Act in place. Um, 12 inmates have now been exonerated and freed from Texas death row because of this act since 1973. Michael Morton was in prison for about 10 years, and he did not, uh, it was, he was devastated because his wife was murdered, and he was, they just decided that he did it, and he didn't take it seriously, and um, the prosecutor ended up um, being, um, Dis, not disbarred, but uh, he had to go practice law in a different country, basically. And I am being told that we need to wind up. We'll uh, have a part three. We're going to hit on some brief things that I didn't hit today. Um, uh, uh, my co-host Cheryl will probably join us next week. And uh, you can join us at IRLongStart.com. Uh, of 4.5, 106.1. Uh, and remember to serve God by serving others. And we'll see you next week. Today's show was recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and all rights and ownership are reserved to Lone Star Community Radio. For more information regarding this program and Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, serving the community with local programming on TV, radio, and online. If you enjoyed today's program, please support us by sponsorship or starting your own show. Contact us today by phone or text at 936-666-1084 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.